This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream. With major national elections in Europe now concluded for 2022, we thought that it would be a good time to reflect on the overall political trends across the continent, how public opinion has shifted, and what the causes of these changes actually are. That's because earlier this year we made a video about the rise of Europe's social democrats, and back then it did seem like the looming cost of living crisis would politically benefit the centre-left, with election results and polling backing this thesis up in the first half of this year. Now though, the tide seems to have shifted, and in fact it's the right-wing parties which came out on top in voter preferences through the balance of 2022. So what changed? Well, let's find out. For years, a number of solidly right-wing and far-right parties have permeated European politics and run on platforms of opposing the European Union and immigration. Most of these parties also have a strong anti-establishment slant, since they perceive the current institutions are being corrupted by left-wing ideology. In opposition to this, their platforms are solidly conservative. For example, many deny climate change as they see it as an attempt by cosmopolitan elites to socially engineer the population and lower standards of living. They apply the same logic to LGBTQ plus issues, which they perceive as an erosion of traditional family values. As such, they attempt to appeal to working and lower middle class voters, who generally feel that their way of life is being threatened by globalization. This message ultimately resonates in poorer post-industrial areas then, which used to be dominated by centre-left parties, but have generally been left behind. Historically, however, most of these parties faced a big issue in the form of a so-called cordon sanitaire, a policy by mainstream parties to never enter government with the radical or extreme right. And this limitation was a major catalyst which forced these parties to self-moderate and become more appealing to the general public. In fact, after the 2008 financial crisis, demand for anti-establishment rhetoric grew higher than ever, and right-wing populism rose from the fringe to completely disrupt mainstream politics. Donald Trump's victory in the US presidential election and Nigel Farage's successful Brexit campaign showed the European right what was possible. And perhaps this year was the most triumphant for them since 2016. The best example of this, and the biggest success for the right, was almost certainly the result of this year's election in Italy, where Giorgia Maloney, leader of the post-fascist Brothers of Italy party, became the first female prime minister of the country. Running a coalition with Matteo Salvini and Silvio Berlusconi, she led the right to command a solid victory in both houses of the Italian parliament. And this was especially alarming for the European Union, since Italy is its third largest member by both population and GDP. Although Maloney has moderated her policy goals and shown some commitment to EU and NATO membership, her social policies are still strongly conservative. Since her entry into politics in 2006, she's been staunchly against immigration, feminism and same-sex partnerships. She's also been a vocal critic of Italy's strict COVID policies, and intends to remove all remaining restrictions on employment of unvaccinated people. Another milestone, though, was this year's election in Sweden, where the formerly neo-Nazi Swedish Democrats became the second largest party in Parliament. That's significant, too, because throughout their existence, all other parties have imposed a strict cordon sanitaire against them. So, in response, while retaining their strong anti-immigration stance, the party purged itself from all of its more extreme members, and subsequently managed to garner more and more support in every general election they've taken part in. And this year was the real breakthrough, because their party's leader was finally able to broker an agreement with the centre-right bloc to provide parliamentary support in exchange for tougher policies on crime, migration, and a focus on nuclear energy instead of renewables. That means that for the first time in Sweden's history, the far right directly influenced government policy, thereby ending their decades-long isolation. And we should also mention France in this list of right-wing successes, where, despite not winning the presidency, Marine Le Pen has made massive gains in the country's legislature. 
After winning 41.5% in the presidential election, Le Pen went on to utilize her expanded electorate in the parliamentary elections held later in the year. Unlike her left-wing counterparts, though, she refused to create a right-wing coalition with Eric Zemmour's Reconquest Party, instead fielding a national rally candidate in every constituency. While the left-wing alliance underperformed, National Rally exceeded expectations and won 89 seats. That's significantly up from 2017, when her party only won seven, not even enough to form a parliamentary group. Today, though, they've become the second largest force in the National Assembly, right after Macron's party. Current polls even show that the French public regard the National Rally as the main opposition to Macron's government, helping it to retain its grip on second place, while the left remains fractured. Finally, let's talk about Hungary, where Viktor Orban has been the country's longest-serving prime minister, initially starting as a centre-right politician who opposed the post-communist Socialist Party. In 2010, though, Orban's party received a supermajority in parliament and used this to change the electoral system and take over control of key institutions. And since then, Orban has strongly opposed the EU's refugee quota system and asserted the country's Christian identity. So, unsurprisingly, confrontations with EU leadership have kept escalating, resulting in the European People's Party ejecting Orban's politicians, and Ursula von der Leyen even making efforts to cut Hungary off from European subsidies. Such is the opposition against him that all opposition parties even entered into one large coalition with the aim of beating him despite the first-past-the-post system. This attempt, however, failed miserably, as voters didn't trust the ideologically incoherent alliance. As such, Orban gained even more votes than in the previous election, consolidating his grip on Hungary for at least another four years. All of this combined poses a big question then. Did the right benefit from the cost of living crisis and the war in Ukraine? A brief answer would be mostly yes. Anti-establishment politicians have been seeing a rise for years now, so the fact that they've seen a breakthrough in the middle of a crisis shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. Both the COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine are external threats that have a massive impact on living standards across Europe. And as such, nationalist politicians offer an alternative in protection against these external threats, as well as a partial withdrawal from the chaotic, globalized world. There's also growing anxiety around a number of other issues, like migration, as well as a deepening cultural divide on topics like LGBTQ plus rights and abortion, which are adding further fuel to the fire. It's also worth mentioning that much of the European voting public remains unfazed by Putin's invasion of Ukraine. After all, both Le Pen and Orban have been some of Putin's strongest allies in Europe, with France's national rally even taking a large loan from Russian banks prior to the war. And while both politicians oppose the invasion, they're also reluctant to exact sanctions which, according to them, would hurt average citizens. This is why Viktor Orban intends to keep supplying Russian gas and has commissioned a Russian company to build two nuclear power plants in Hungary, as well as a new crude oil pipeline from Russia. On the other hand, the Sweden Democrats and Brothers of Italy are actually more pro-Ukrainian, and have committed to work with NATO on supplying arms to Kiev. These factors combined then show that the war itself hasn't played that much of a factor, as both pro-Russian and anti-Russian right and far-right politicians did equally well this year. Which suggests that it's not the war itself, but the consequences of it, such as a hit to people's living standards, which gave these parties their political mandate and could explain why we've seen more right-wing politics emerging in the second half of this year. Okay, that was likely the last TLDR EU video of the year. So I'd like to take a moment and thank you for watching one last time. This has been a massive year for the channel, and we really appreciate your continued support, viewership, and subscription. Let me also take one last opportunity to remind you that Nebula have a sale on right now, and that that sale will be over by the next time I talk to you. So this really is your last chance to get this great discount. 